Good afternoon, Senator Kevin Wickos here for, with another version of Veterans of the Month. Today is uh, February 1st, and I am pleased to welcome with me today Joe Richards, who served as a corporal in the United States Marine Corps. Joe, thank you for inviting me to your wonderful home. It's certainly a pleasure and an honor to meet with you today. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So I, first of all, I want to I thank you for your service uh, to, to your country, and I want to give the viewers the understanding of a little bit about your background, where you came from, where you were born, and how you ended up here in, in Connecticut. Uh, I was born in uh, New, Be New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, in Ju July 22, 1922. And uh, we migrated here to Hartford when I was about three or four years old. It was during the Depression, and my dad was a carpenter, and he got a job here in Hartford when they were building the Aetna building on Farmington Avenue. So he brought the family to Hartford, and we located in Fog Hollow section, which was French community, and we belonged to St. Saint, Saint Anne's Church. I went to Catholic school, mm -hmm. French Catholic school, and from there I went to Hartford High School, graduated from Hartford High. So it's interesting, you know, when you see the landscape of a city, if your father was one of the ones that actually built the Etna building, you saw the, the beginning of the skyline of Hartford from where it used to be to where it is today. It's amazing. Exactly. And now, so obviously this is the year we were in beginning into what, World War II? 19, uh, my dad moved in in 1928, 1927. Okay. And uh, I graduated from in 1940. And then I went to work at Pratt Whitney in 1941 and uh, I stayed there for about a year and a half two years and when the war broke out in 1941 in 1942 I joined the Marines. So it wasn't soon thereafter I mean everybody remembers the day of infamy December 7th 1941 and exactly. did, did that I, you know I, I I wasn't around then but I, I want to think that the same sense of patriotism like after September 11th in my day where people rushed to join the military to support their country. Did you get that same feeling, or what, what was happening after December 7, 1941 in America? I would say that uh, it, it, it had a slow start, but once it got rolling, everybody was into it. I mean, uh, I was working at Pratt Whitney in a defense plant, and I had the opportunity to get a deferment from the draft, but uh, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to get into it. Like everybody was getting into right. it. Did you, you know. go down to your local recruitment office with a friend, or did you yes, just I did. said, I'm, "I'm going down"? And what did your mom and dad say? Or did went, you not tell them? I didn't tell them to begin with. Okay. They knew it was coming, and it, because the surrounding uh, relatives, some of our relatives and some of our neighborhood friends, were already in the military. Okay. So they knew it was coming. So I did. I went down with my buddy. Al Gagnon, we went down to the Marine Recruiting Office in Hartford, and we signed up. And uh, a week later, I got a letter to report. And uh, I reported to Hartford, and it was the day before Thanksgiving. And they shipped us to Springfield to be sworn in. And uh, we were sworn in the day before Thanksgiving. And we spent Thanksgiving Day in Springfield walking the streets. Right. They weren't, nothing was happening. Sure. Everything was closed. Thanksgiving Day was observed, you know. So then the next day we were on a train on our way to Paris Island. You know, people said the red tape of government was awfully slow, I guess, unless you joined the military. <laughs> yeah. with, because one week you, you were already exactly. signed up and on your way down. Yes. Uh, and Now, Paris Island, that's in South Carolina? Yes, it is. And, and from my understanding, that's the place where all the Marine Corps uh, candidates go for their boot camp, if you will. Yes, the boot camp uh, was... Uh, we got down there, we got down the train, we got there in the middle of the night. And uh, the first thing we did is we were issued clothes, you know, our uniforms, our everything. And then we, from there, we went to a barber shop where you were just clean shaven all over. You right. just, uh, nothing left. And uh, then we were taken to our barracks. And then the next morning, it was early rise, five o'clock in the morning, and uh, breakfast, and then out to the drill field till noontime, back lunch, back out to the drill field. 
We did at least three weeks or four weeks of just, just drill. Okay. It was discipline. So. And, and was your friend Alan with you the whole time? Did you get to No, just... Al got called. I got called before he did. Uh, he was younger than I was, so he got called about two weeks after I did. Okay. So. And at what point did you pick out or were you assigned a specific job that you knew you were going to have to do once basic training was over? Uh, I didn't have a choice. I okay. mean, you know, at that time they needed they needed bodies, you know, and uh, so we shipped from Paris Island. We went to Camp Lejeune, but they told us not to unpack our bags because we wouldn't be there long. Within a day or two, we were on a train, a troop train, and we traveled five days on the train to California to Los Angeles, and uh, in Los Angeles we. At the train station, we got on trucks, and the trucks took us to Camp Pendleton, California, which was down by Oceanside, California. And uh, I was assigned to an infantry battalion and assigned to a machine gun platoon, and that's where I started my training with the machine gun. So how long did you have for training for, on the machine gun in, in the infantry, what your tasks would be? Well, I, all the time, it was at least uh, until we went into combat, which was uh, almost a year of training at Pendleton. You know, we, we, we did a lot of uh, night firing, uh, target practicing, and uh, much of that with the machine gun. We had competition between squads, right. who would set it up the fastest and that type of thing. And we did well with our squad. So when you were there, did you see uh, an, an expediting of uh, trying to get every, more troops coming in as the war was getting bigger, or a rush? Or you know, it was generally it's a year training, and then you the war was shipping you out to your destination. No, we we pretty much uh, we were. I was in the twenty fourth regiment, which was in California. I was in the fourth Marine Division. And the division consisted of three regiments, three infantry regiments. And the 23rd and the 25th were established on the East Coast. When they were brought over on the, onto the West Coast to join the 24th, then we were a full division. And then they had the artillery uh, regiment and all the other. And it was a, they built up to around 17 or 18,000 full strength. For a division? For the 4th Marine Division, wow. yes. And then, uh, so you completed your year of, of training, and then what? Does everybody go to a, a hall and they say, this is your assignment, where you're going, or does the whole division go? Or how do they well, we divvy went, the troops up from that point? Well, we went as a group. We, were, we traveled down by, by truck to uh, San Diego and boarded ship. This was around New Year's in January 1944. We boarded ships, and we headed out as a, a convoy, the whole right. division as a convoy. We went to um, Hawaii, and we did some practice landings in Hawaii. And then we got aboard ship again, and we traveled out to the Marshall Islands. And uh, at the Marshall Islands, we were went into a lagoon, Kwajalein Atoll, which consisted of several islands. And the main islands were Roy, which had an airfield, Japanese airfield, and Namur, which uh, housed the defenders of the island. There's about right. 3,000 Japs on that island. And uh, we were assigned as the first wave, our, our battalion, the second battalion of the 24th Regiment. So we went in the first day. It was your landing similar to what people see in the movies or on... Um, uh, history Channel, like in the invasion of Normandy, where the, you, the boat carrier would land, it would open up, and the troops would just come rushing out. Is exactly, that, it, pretty much like yeah. Well, we went in on in the Marshall Islands. We went in on these uh, tanks. We were it was a uh, open tank where it, it was in the well, and and we were on that. And the tracks were like cups. Okay. That moved the tank to shore. We were on the first wave, so we went in that way. So that with that type of a vehicle was able to get in right at the beach. Sure. And the way we got out, they didn't have the ramp on those tanks at that time. We had to jump over the side. 
And did you meet any resistance uh, when you? No, we mandate? heard a lot of fire, and we there was there was many, not many, half a dozen dead Japs on, on on the beach when we got out, and we knew you know we could hear fire over our heads, artillery right. over our heads, and uh, uh, anyway, my buddy and I. Don Herwick, we were together, and we were laying prone because we could. The gunfire was coming from from the direction, and we laid. And um, anyway, Don and I were about three feet apart right. on the beach, and, and we were hugging the beach. Mm -hmm. And I was literally, I could almost feel like I was crawling in my helmet, right, for protection. Sure. I mean, you know. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. And uh, at any rate, there was a large explosion, a tremendous explosion. It shook the whole island, and we could feel little pieces of fragment coming down, hitting on us. And then I heard this whoosh, 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 and the whoosh, whoosh got louder and louder and louder. And all of a sudden, right between the both of us, we were three feet apart, was this large metal, looked like the front end of a torpedo. It was all jagged edge. It was within inches of my body and within inches. Well, Don Herwick and I, from that point on, we were like this. Mm. After we got out, he lived in uh, outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Right. He called me up when he was getting married, wanted to know if I'd be his best man. That's great. I flew down to Pittsburgh and spent uh, almost a week with him down there. Good. So what ha you uh, obviously the rest of the division or your platoon got on the island and then, then we you moved secured up. that? And yeah, well, we, we moved up and we set up our machine gun. I was not the gunner in that. I was an okay. ammunition carrier. But our gunner was was firing and uh, a sniper uh, fired at our position and one of the bullets ricocheted on the side of the machine gun and caught him in the shoulder and put him out of action so he was evacuated. But that was on the uh, island of Namur in the Marshalls. How many different uh, islands did you visit during I your landed, tour? I landed in Namur. I made a landing at Saipan. On Saipan, I, I only did 10 days when I was wounded on Saipan and evacuated to a hospital ship anchored offshore. And I was transported back to Pearl Harbor in the hospital, i.e. Heights Hospital at, uh, uh, at Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. And then after I recuperated from that, I was sent back to my base camp, which was on Maui. We had a base camp on Maui, waiting for the troops to come back from, right. from uh, the Marianas. Then when they came back, we got new replacements, and we spent a lot of time training the new replacements uh, establishing our platoon again. I was right. in the same platoon. We had lost, uh, on Namor, we lost our uh, platoon, Lieutenant West. He got killed on uh, on Namor. Now we had a new platoon leader for Saipan, and then we, we lost a few men on Saipan, quite a few. And then we got replacements. We're back now on Maui, and we got our replacements, and now we're pre preparing for our next landing. And, uh, and where was that? We trained for that. That was on Iwo Jima. Uh, Iwo Jima, we were, we didn't land on Saipan. I, I don't think we landed in the first wave. I don't remember. We did on Amur, but on Iwo Jima, we were in a position, the 24th Regiment was what they call floating reserve. Right. And uh, the 23rd Regiment and the 25th Regiment of the 4th made the initial landing. And we were out there in reserve, and then when any of the hot spots showed up, somebody was in, you know, they, they broken up. Then they sent, then we went in. Okay. Uh, 24th. So you, the, the 24th went into the most dangerous parts because if it was a hot spot, yeah, then that, the enemy's there. Yeah, right. And what happened to you on Iwo Jima? Uh, I remember sand. I remember having trouble because it was a sandy, heavy sandy soil. I guess, and, and you, you took a step forward and you go two back. It, it was that steep. And of course, I'm carrying 
my rifle and I'm carrying a tripod. I'm a gunner at this point. And the, uh, we, were, we were carrying uh, what they called air-cooled machine guns. Okay. We had the water cool, but the, we never used the water cool in combat. It was too heavy. It was a 50-pounder, and the tripod was 50 pounds. So you couldn't move very well. Trying to with run those. with 100 pounds on your back is pretty right. difficult. Yeah. But the air cooled was much easier for advancing, for you know, moving up mm -hmm. from, and we moved from pothole to pothole. I mean, to shell hole to shell hole is right. what we did. We got to the, uh, we got there on Iwo. We got to the first embankment, and just as we were coming to the crest, there was an airfield ahead of us. That was our first objective. And we heard that what the Jets were doing is they were using ACAC -ac guns, which are anti-aircraft guns, but they were using them at ground level. Okay. So, but I don't Your remember. Your objective was to take those guns out? Somebody did. Okay. You know, maybe the artillery. I really don't know what. Mm -hmm. There's a lot that you find out later. Sure. I mean, you're in combat. Uh, you're interested in there's somebody on my right and there's somebody on my left. I know who those are. But beyond that, you really don't know what's going on, you know, because it's there's a lot, a lot going on. And so you, your your target was just to take the airfield. Exactly. And did something happen to you on Iwo Jima? Well, uh, how it happened, and I don't, I I just know the date it happened because it's on my, it's on my record of when I got the Purple Heart. Uh, the only thing I remember about getting wounded is I had run across an open area. And I was headed for a shell hole, and I dove for the shell and got in there. And when I got in there, uh, I looked at my hand and I had blood running down. You know, I said, "What the heck is this?" You know, and I wipe it off. And what it is is little fragments of of, uh, of uh, shrapnel were embedded in the back of my hand here. You know. So the corpsman came over and he he picked them out like picking out slivers. Right. The larger ones. Some of the smaller ones he didn't bother. Just he just banded them up. And those came out on their own later on, mm -hmm. you know, because they were little pieces of metal. But that's how I, that's that's all. I was all right. There was nothing wrong with my hand. Right. You know. That was the second time that you were injured. Yeah. Um, the first one I got on this hand here, this, and this still bothers me a lot today, but not, not a a whole lot. Sure. You know. If you could, if you could go back and had to do it all over again, what, would you do it again? Oh yes, I think I would. I think I would. I, if I knew the combat situation, mm -hmm. I think about it. I, you know, I, I, I was scared. Sure. There wasn't a, wasn't a man on that line, and all the times that we did it, and the more I did it, the scarier I got. Sure. You know, because I knew what was there. Have, have you ever visited the Iwo Jima Memorial? In New Britain? Yes, I'm a member of that organization. You are. And I have a brick we were able to, with your name on it, you know. Yes, I, I do go there. Well, yeah. Thank you for your service. I know a lot yeah. of people that uh, that's certainly something that I know the school kids, um, when, they, when they learned about World War II, was the Battle of Iwo Jima. Yeah. You know, with the picture that, and the, uh, the statute that's over in New Britain, Connecticut. Uh, if you had the opportunity to pass on the message to our the current military men and women that are serving our country, what, what would you you'd like to say to them about your experience or, or message to them, what their job that they're doing today? Well, I, I, I think, I, I can't think of, well, I, I think what I would say, be proud. Be proud of your service. I would be so thankful. I, 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 it brings a tear to my eye when I read in the newspapers, here in the news, about these young people over in Afghanistan and what we're going through today. And when I hear of a death of one of those young people, I know what it is, and it bothers me, you know. But I say be proud, you know. Respect your flag, and uh, be proud that you're an American. I, I don't know what else to say. I'm out of words. I, I think I think that's... You said enough, and you said it so eloquently and honorable. Thank you. Thank you, and it's been a pleasure, folks, being in the home of uh, Corporal, um, Corporal Joe to be here today, to hear his wonderful story 
Um, thank you for your service uh, to your state and to your country, and it's been an honor and a pleasure, sir. I appreciate thank it. You, thank you. Thank you. Corporal Joe Richards.